Well, happy Father's Day, everyone. Uh, we sincerely pray that this is a wonderful Father's Day for all you fathers out there. And I, I pray that this message today, it, it challenges you and it encourages you uh, as well. And, and for today, we do want to uh, take some time to look to the Word of God. And, and for just a thought, it would be what is found in a godly father. What is found in a godly father. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to the book of First Thessalonians. If you turn to chapter 2, we're going to look in verses 10, 11, and 12 this morning. And while you're turning there, uh, I, I just want to share uh, with us that if we have our eyes open to this world... If we're able to see what all is going on in this world that we're living in, we can see that there is truly a need for godly fathers setting godly examples for their children. Uh, little boys need godly fathers to teach them how to be a, fa a husband and a father. And little girls need godly fathers to teach them of what to look for in a husband and a father for their children. Uh, while the root of the world's problems, that, we, that this world's problems is, is sin, we can easily see that there are some problems that could be rectified if the world had more godly fathers in it. Well, in 2007... Casting Crowns released an album titled The Altar and the Door. And from the album, they released a single titled Slow Fade. Now, this song centers around the fact that there are consequences to making bad decisions. And the lyrics of the first verse and chorus are, Be careful, little eyes, what you see. It's the second glance that ties the hands as darkness pulls the strings. Be careful, little feet, where you go. For it's the little feet behind you that are sure to follow. It's a slow fade when you give yourself away. It's a slow fade when black and white have turned to gray. Thoughts invade. A choice is made. A price is paid when you give yourself away. People never crumble in a day. It's a slow fade. When we as fathers give ourselves away to sin and we fail to do our best to, to be godly fathers for our children and be the father that God would have us to be, the consequences are far too often lived out in our children following in our footsteps. Our children making some of the same bad choices that we make. So as we look in this passage, we see that Paul gives us some characteristics of living as a godly father. The Bible tells us here in chapter 2 in verses 10, 11, and 12, Paul says, you are witnesses. And God also, how devoutly and justly and blameless we have behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. That you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Oh, this is God's holy word. Pray with us. God, as we do look to you today, we just thank you that you've given us a day that we can honor fathers. God, fathers play such an important role in the lives of children. And we pray, God, that, that fathers everywhere are are taking serious their responsibility and that they have a reputation of being the man that you would have them to be. God, as we look to you today, we pray that you would speak to the hearts of every father in this world, those who are living as godly as they can. God, we pray that you would encourage them and strengthen them and those, God, who are failing at this responsibility. God, we pray that you would Convict their hearts and help them to see their need and their children's need for a godly presence in their lives. Now, God, we pray that you would move and minister 
throughout the, this service and that God, whatever said and done, that you would be glorified, your son magnified, and your people edified. And God, we're trusting you in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When we look at the circumstances that surround this letter that Paul is writing to the Thessalonians, we understand that the church in Thessalonica at this time, or Thessalonica at this time, it is under heavy persecution. The Jewish religionists were set on destroying the church and the reputation of the church's founder, the Apostle Paul. They were attempting to convince the people that the preaching of Christ would destroy their freedom and it would affect their jobs and their businesses. The persecution came, became so violent that Paul had to flee for his life. But, but what we have to understand is that because Paul left, that didn't put an end to the persecution. The persecution be, continued as they would spread rumors concerning Paul and his teaching. Understanding this and understanding that the believers in Thessalonica were becoming discouraged, Paul wrote this letter to encourage them. But first, he would need to speak to the charges that were levied against him. He wanted there to be no misunderstanding about him or the ministry of Jesus Christ. He was a true minister of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And while this passage speaks to the characteristics of a true minister of the gospel, these same characteristics can be found in the minister of the home. That, that minister should be found in the form of a godly father. So what we noticed in this text first is the reputation of a godly father. Now, as we look here in verse 10, Paul speaks of himself as a minister of the gospel. And while the religious Jews were attacking his character, the believers were witnesses of this true character. The believers could testify of God's reputation as a true minister of the gospel. Fathers, there. Those who come in contact with us, whether we're on our job, whether we're in a doctor's office, whether we're, we're in public or we're with our neighbors or even with our friends and with our families, we should carry a certain reputation. That, that, and that is that we are godly fathers. Paul says that the believers were witnesses that he was a devout man. And while... What should be witnesses of godly fathers is that they are devout Christians. In, in other words, we should be striving to live holy lives before God, separating ourselves from the world and, and giving ourselves to the will of God. Romans 12 and 2 tells us to not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But Paul also speaks that the believers witnessed him being a just or a righteous man. As godly fathers, we should be seen as just or righteous men. We are to live our lives, demonstrate love for one another by treating others as, as God and not society or, or not as history would have us to. Luke 6 and 31 shares that just as you want men to do to you, also do to them likewise. And Paul also speaks of the believers, witness of him being a blameless man. And as godly fathers, we must be blameless. Blameless before God and blameless before others. Philippians 2, 14 through 15 tells us to do all things without complaining and disputing. That you may become blameless and, and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now this doesn't mean that we must live perfect lives. This doesn't mean that we won't fall short. Romans 3 and 23 reminds us that we all fall short of the glory of God. But this does mean that as godly fathers, our reputation is that, is that speaking of according to the, the will of God rather than the will of men. It's that our lives are our lives that in such manner that we, 
that the world knows that we won't stand for the mistreatment of others. Instead, that we come to the aid of the poor and the widows because we understand Proverbs 21 and 13 that says, whoever shuts his ears to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be heard. It means that the world will know that we live our lives as people who truly believe God's word, that they, that they will know that we fully believe the only that only the redeemed, only the born again believers and those who have received Jesus as their Lord and Savior will be welcomed into the kingdom of God. As godly fathers, our lives must be a witness that Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives. C.S. Lewis once said, how little people know who think holiness is dull. When one meets the real thing, it's irresistible. Even if 10% of the world's population had it, would not the whole world be converted and happy before the year's end? Oh, it seems C.S. Lewis is saying that there's not even 10, that not even 10% of the fathers in the world are godly fathers. And if you are listening to this message today, I want to declare to you that your children, no matter how old they are, they desperately, they desperately need a godly father in their lives. Yes, our reputation should be if we are a father in this world, in this wicked world that we live in, our reputation should be that we are a godly father. And notice in this passage, Paul shares the responsibility of a godly father. Again, as we look in verse 11, what we find is that the believers of Thessalonica were witnesses to how he held up to his responsibility as a minister of the gospel. While the religious leaders attacked his teachings of the truth of God's word, the believers were witnesses of Paul's passion as he exhorted the truth of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as godly fathers, we must have this same passion about the gospel of Jesus Christ and be willing to unapologetically exhort the truth of the gospel to our children. In other words, we direct them, we guide them, and we teach them of God's holy word. Fathers, it's not us. If, if it's not us teaching, guiding, and directing our children, then the world's going to take our place. And if the world takes our place, then the world will guide, direct, and teach our children according to Matthew's Gospel 7 and 13, how to travel a road that leads to destruction. Don't be naive. Oh, please don't be naive and, and, and say, well, I didn't have a father to teach, guide, and direct me, I, and I'm okay. They'll be okay. No, don't be that selfish. God, by his grace, has brought you to the point of where you are in this life, and he's given you the gift of children. Now live up to your responsibility and lead them as a godly father would or should. But these... But the believers of Thessalonica were also witnesses that through the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Paul also comforted them. And as godly fathers, there are times when we must comfort our children. This may not always be easy for us, but we just need to get over ourselves. We need to be there and be courageous enough to encourage, console, and, and support our children. We know that they're going to experience pain in this sin-cursed world. And it's up to us as men and fathers to do our part to ease their pain. For if we fail to ease their pain, they'll become hardened to the gospel and they'll turn to the world. Philippians 2, 1 and 2, 1 through 2 tells us, Therefore, if there is any consolation 
in Christ, if any comfort in love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. And what he is saying here is that if God has consoled us, if there is comfort in knowing that God loves us, if we have fellowship with the spirit because of the Lord's love for us, if we've experienced his affection and his mercy, then our children should should experience the same thing from us and we should share this with others in this world. We are to be of one mind and that is like-minded to Jesus Christ. Also the believers of Thessalonica they were witnesses of Paul honoring the responsibility or his responsibility as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ and he charged everyone he didn't just exhort them he didn't just comfort them but he charged them as godly fathers we must charge our children in other words we must warn them of the dangers of this world that, that the world will lay traps before them and we must warn them of these traps Colossians 2 and 8 tells us to beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy or, or empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. As godly fathers, we have a responsibility that we must live up to and unless we are a real presence in our children's life, we can't begin to live up to this responsibility. If we look at the story of Job. What we find is that the Bible calls him a blameless and upright man. King James, in his version, he calls him a perfect and an upright man. He's not saying he's sinless, he's saying he's blameless. He was a, a man who feared the Lord and he shunned evil. Job had 10 children, seven boys and three girls. And it appears that Job really lived up to his responsibility to his children. It appears that he exhorted his children. It appears he comforted them and, and he also charged them. Why do I say that? Because the Bible tells us that when his sons would go in and have feasts in their homes, that they would call their sisters to come and join them so all of his children would be together and they would be eating and they would be drinking together. But when their feast was over, Job sent for them. I imagine Job's love was so great that when he sent for them, he exhorted them. He comforted them and he charged them because the Bible tells us that he sanctified them and that he would rise early and offer up burnt offerings on their behalf. That he would do this just in case they had sinned and cursed God. The Bible says... In Job 1 and 5, thus Job did regularly. <laughs> now, let me ask, do you think Job's sacrifices made a difference with his children being right with God? Well, truthfully, I can't say so. I, I, I believe his children had to stand before God for their own sin. However, I do believe it made a difference with his children whether they were right with God or not, they knew that their father had done everything in his power to lead them to God. In his reputation and fulfilling his responsibility, Job, like Paul, would, would be able to walk worthy of God and, walk, and God called them into his own kingdom and glory. And my question to you, fathers, whether this is your first Father's Day or whether you've had many Father's Days, whether you are a young father or you have some age on you, whether you ha have the privilege of being a grandfather or you're still awaiting that day. My question, are you fulfilling your responsibility in being a godly father? Does your reputation speak of you being a godly man? Are you doing as Job everything in your power to know that your children know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? I don't know if you're doing this, but if you haven't, you can begin today. First things first, you must be born again. 
you must have a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. So I ask you, are you ready? Are you ready to repent of your sins? Are you ready to admit that you need a savior? Are you ready to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and savior? If you are, then you're ready to become that godly father that God is calling you to be. And if you want today to be your very best father's day, then today trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and savior. And if you're wondering, how do I do this? Well, first, you have to settle in your heart. Do you believe that Jesus is God's only begotten son? Do you believe he was born of a virgin? Do you believe that he, can't, he was born into this sin-cursed world? He lived a perfect life. And for this, they nailed him to an old rugged cross. And on that cross, he bled and died for your sin. For the sin of the world. Do you believe that, that when they placed him in that barred tomb, that on the third day he arose under his own power, conquering death, hell, and the grave? Do you believe that, that he's ascended to the Father? He's at his Father's right hand making intercession for those whose names have been recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life? Do you believe that one day he's coming back to receive his church, his bride, and, and that we will be adorned as God would have us to be? Do you believe this? If you believe, are you ready to repent of your sin? Acknowledging Jesus is the Savior of the world. Oh, if you are, then just pray with me. God, I believe your son, Jesus Christ, your only begotten son, is the Savior of the world. I believe he died for my sins. And God, I repent of my sins. And I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. God, I thank you for loving me enough that you would give your only begotten son. Thank you, God, for forgiving me of my sins. Thank you for saving me. Now help me, God, to be the father, to be the man, to be the woman, to be the girl that you would have me to be. And God... I'll praise you for it all. I'm going to look to you for strength. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, I'm going to trust you and walk in your ways. Thank you again for loving me and saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Oh, if you prayed this prayer and you believed in your heart that Jesus has forgiven you of your sins and that he has saved you today. Oh, we want to celebrate this with you. We want to know that you have been saved. So in the comments, in an, in an inbox, through a phone call, through just sharing with someone else, let us know that today you gave your life to Jesus. Today is going to be the best day that you've had thus far in this world. And let us celebrate with you. Oh, we want to celebrate. And if you happen to be a father who's give your life to Jesus, oh, we want to encourage you as you begin your journey of being a godly father. Oh, while, while our choir leads us in the song of invitation, would you, would you share this great news with us? And we'll begin celebrating along with the angels in heaven who are celebrating right now with you. Would you today? Oh, we, we love you. We thank you. We appreciate you being with us. And Reedy Branch, we want to say to you, oh, we love you. We miss you. And we're looking forward to the time when we can be here together worshiping our Lord and Savior. And if you who are listening don't have a church, don't have a, a church that you call your home church, Oh, we'd love for you to spend some time with us right here at Reedy Branch Baptist Church. It may be a little while before we get back into the sanctuary. But when we do, we'd love for you to spend some time with us. And you see if this is where God would have you to be. And I believe the people of this church will welcome you. will love on you. 
will celebrate with you the love of Jesus Christ. Again, we thank you for being with us. We pray God richly blesses each one of you. God, we love you. We just thank you for this day. Thank you for the love that you've poured upon us. For God, we wouldn't know love without your love. So now we ask that you would be with us. Help us be in this world what you would have us to be. And we'll praise you for everything that's accomplished. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.